When the world pulls us apart and we're forced to live in isolation, we return to the thing that all of humanity has in common. The natural soil and air and sunshine from which we came. Stay sane, stay safe, and join us on our socially distanced journey into nature. Our story begins with me on an early summer day. After packing up, I set off and headed north towards Salamone Lake. After a peaceful drive through the Indiana countryside, I reached the Blood Root Trailhead. I signed in and paid the camping fee, then made my way onto the trail, which went parallel to the road for a little while. Okay, feels good to be on the trail. That was a short drive. I'm gonna hazard a guess and say that I'm the first person on the trail today. Beautiful day, perfect weather. I think it's gonna be pretty good. And later in the afternoon, I was starting my journey with Thomas. Okay, welcome to the Andrew and Thomas portion of this socially distanced episode. Of course, we're carpooling, which kind of defeats the purpose. But yeah, we don't want to contaminate Brian and Robbie with our filth. Yeah, there's a lot of filth in this car. <laughs> so we are headed to Cider Grove Metro Park, which is actually in Columbus. This is well, the first time ever going camping in Columbus. Whenever we go anywhere, my parents are like, this looks just like High Banks Metro Park. Why don't you just go there? And now they'll be incredibly justified. Yeah, in they, this one they, they win. We had a short drive to Cider Grove Metro Park. After driving on a dusty gravel road, we made our way to the trailhead and readied our gear. Near the parking lot, we saw some poison hemlock plants growing several feet high. There were also some aster flowers, thickets of goldenrod and dogbane, and red clover flowers. But after examining the plants around us, we made our way to the trailhead where we checked the map, reviewed and finalized our plans, and then headed out. For our overnight backpacking trip, we would hike south on the REI Trail, before looping around in an open meadowy area and heading back to the trailhead. I had also headed out making my way south. There was an accident on the road, and hopefully no one was seriously hurt. I had to take a detour, but eventually I made it to the trail. I would be hiking the same trail Robbie and I had done a couple years ago at Wayne National Forest. So I actually got a pretty late start to the hike. There was some accident or something on the road. Now I've got about maybe two and a half good hours of daylight thinking I'll probably hike for maybe an hour and a half of that, set up camp, have some dinner, and just uh, see how the night goes. As Brian was setting out, I was hiking in the sunshine. So the trail is a roughly 14 mile loop. The campsites are probably about halfway. So I'm looking for like seven miles today, seven miles tomorrow. Oh my God, dude, you could not have asked for better weather than what it is today. The light of the day and the cool breeze made this a perfect summer day. All around, the tranquil melody of nature filled the air. This is so peaceful and relaxing that I kind of just want to sit down in this field 
and not keep walking. <laughs> The Bloodroot Trail is a 14-mile loop that cuts through meadows, forests, and farmlands. In many sections, including the one I was in now, the trail ran parallel to itself. It also often intersects with itself, making the trail a series of figure eights. I would be hiking to the campsites near the halfway mark of the trail, camping overnight, then finishing the loop the next morning. In some areas, there were caution signs. Most likely because this trail is also used by fast-moving snowmobiles in the wintertime. Well, it's a little sunnier than I anticipated even today. I have to get out of the sun sooner. Sunscreen up. That's one thing I do not do anymore, is I do not mess with the sun. Wow, dude, this place is just... The word I was looking for, but apparently didn't find, was idyllic. I guess somebody lost some sandwiches. Man, speaking of sandwiches, it is right around lunchtime and I am starving right now. <laughs> if you saw my last video, you know that the food choices are gonna be very, very Spartan. Man, this is why I miss hiking with the other guys, man. They always bring good food. I just bring garbage. So unlike Brian and Robbie's trail, the trail we're doing is a lot shorter and a lot easier. Part of the reason for that is because this trail is designed to get people who have never backpacked before into backpacking. Right here from the trailhead, it teaches you the seven principles of leaving no trace. You can go by each one and see how well we do. Rule seven was be considerate of others. I'm not going to be considerate of you. <laughs> it didn't take long before I came across flowers that caught my attention. So these flowers here uh, are called Dame's Rockets. I only recently learned this, but this plant is actually edible. In some places, the, the vegetable arugula is referred to as like a sort of rocket, but this is in the mustard family. You can tell because one, the flowers have four petals. A lot of mustard plants will have four petals. It's also got these long, thin little seed pods, which is pretty common of mustard plants. But yeah, you can use the, the leaves raw, and I've actually thrown them on like pizza um, and kind of let them cook a little bit in the heat after baking a pizza. And it's just like having arugula on top of something. Is this the same type of mustard that goes next to my ketchup? <laughs> it's probably related on, on some level, but no. <laughs> you look very angelic right now. <laughs> This is the last time you asked me to come film you. <laughs> so there was a scene in the Hawaii episode where I said, if you if you squint your eyes, you can pretend like this is the Midwest. If you stop and you, you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, it really does kind of look a lot like the Midwest. But here we are, and I feel like we're just back in Hawaii. And it was actually Andrew who said that, so I'm not that crazy. <laughs> but it does smell different. It smells like, I don't know, <laughs> less, less tropical. <laughs> Along the trail, there were paths shooting off towards the riverbank, so we decided to take a quick detour. The river was calm, and there were interesting trees growing along its banks. So a feature that you always see in metro parks in Columbus are these really big sycamore trees lining the river bank. Um, and in fact, one of the largest sycamores I think is in Columbus. But they're pretty characteristic because they have this really interesting camo pattern white bark. Um, although sometimes towards the bottom of the tree, it's a little more like a typical tree. But I have heard that uh, if you tap this tree and you drink the sap in it, it kind of like takes any water and purifies it. So, you know, in an emergency scenario, it'd be a good source of water. So actually another thing that often grows in these metro parks are pawpaw trees. And in this area in particular, there's like a good amount of them. Usually like I don't see them getting this big. Uh, they're kind of more of an undergrowth tree. But yeah, they've got these huge broad leaves. Obviously one of my favorite trees. <laughs> and unfortunately we are just past the season where all the beautiful flowers are coming out. Um, but yeah, those are super pretty too. And uh, one other way I can identify pawpaws is by looking at the bark. Sometimes it has these little like almost holes or eyes in the bark. It's super subtle, but once you pick up on it, uh, you won't miss it. Violet leaves also grew in the ground below, and the sun shone through the tops of the walnut trees above. We hadn't hiked a whole lot, so we continued on. As the others kept on, I stopped to take in the familiar scenery. So the first time Robbie and I came here, we did hike this same loop starting at the same area, but it was dark. We got here at night. We didn't actually see that um, dike over there, and that's where we finished our hike. 
when we met up with Andrew and finished the next couple days. So right now I can actually see where I'm gonna be finishing this hike. I kept hiking on the trail, taking in large rocks and bluffs from solid ground. The lake was beautiful to take in, but there were also more familiar sights on the trail. Okay, so if you remember from our last Wayne video, this is actually the junction that Robbie and I split off of to go find our campsite. But at that point, it was dark, and I think we had basically assumed we'd have a better chance of finding a campsite up there than along the Lakeshore Trail. Um, but since there's plenty of time, I think I might just stick along the Lakeshore Trail, see what we find. Along the trail, I came to a parking lot where I stopped for a bite of lunch. In the meantime, I continued hiking through the meadows. After a little while, I came to a highway crossing. It turns out the road was closed for construction on a bridge down the way. Well, that makes crossing slightly easier, which is nice. As a group of other backpackers passed me, I stopped to have an afternoon snack. One of our viewers, Christian, sent some cookies from Guam. Chamorro chip cookies. They're kind of like little cookie crisp style cookies. And I'll be honest, I ate most of the bag already. <laughs> Once again, with only me in charge of food, my other, much more sad option was cheese and tortillas. In all honesty, I'm slightly embarrassed about it because it looks so sad. But this is actually really good. I mean, it's got the calories, a little protein, probably some calcium, the food groups. Does it have all the food groups? I don't know. After that, I applied more sunscreen and was on my way. Looks like right after you cross that road, you're about just at the one mile marker. This is an interesting trail because it's a loop, but it's kind of like it's got lots of figure eights and you cross over and then on the way back, you go on the other side of the figure eight. When you look at the map, it really doesn't seem like that much distance because it's kind of intertwined. For an overnighter though, 14 miles is like perfect. Just ahead, I could see another section where the trail ran parallel to itself just a few feet away. It's a parallel trail over here. So on the way back, I'll be taking this trail. It's basically the same trail, but. Then I came to another road crossing and the trail entered a slightly more wooded area. Eventually the trail spilled out into a small parking lot where I was again met with open sky. A vulture soared above, and the scenes of rural farmland surrounded me. This area is not really out in the forest or anything. It's just right next to a bunch of roads, a bunch of farms. I'm not sure what this little parking lot is. It says wildlife management area. This looks cool though. As the trees swayed in the wind, I got my bearings and continued on. I'm not sure I've had a more peaceful day in a very long time. With the strange combination of scenery, sparse trees, meadows, and rural civilization, this hike almost felt like a peaceful walk through a park or a neighborhood. the first trail I've ever been on that has a wrong way. Now my guess is that's because this is a snowmobile route also, 
So you don't want snowmobiles crashing into each other. You want it to be one way. I imagine they wouldn't really care if hikers go the other direction. Back in Ohio, we had stopped to admire a weird looking tree. Let's have a conversation about this tree. Because I walked by this. I was like, man, that bark is cool. But yeah. I don't know what tree this is. This is a hackberry. I feel like this is the kind of bark that Robbie would want to like sandpaper smooth or something. <laughs> the trypophobia? Yeah, it, they get really bumpy and warty looking, but. You know, with a name like hackberry, I feel like there's gotta be berries. Is yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There are? There's none right now. They typically come out like in October. Okay. Um, but they're kind of like these tiny little berries with a big pit. Yeah, it's kind of like dry, but it, I feel like it has a figgy flavor, like a mildly sweet fig flavor. Right? So is this something that you, you could eat or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you could, okay. I've actually made the other guys eat it one time in our mammoth cave trip. All I remember is this bark is, is tripping me out here. Yeah, yeah. Good thing Robbie's not here. <laughs> Let's go. And just up ahead was another interesting tree. So we were walking by these huge trees and like the sycamore, these also tend to enjoy being near water. And you didn't know what these were until you saw the leaves. Right, right. right. But how'd you know the base on the trunk? After like seeing them for a while, like the bark just has this like chunky kind of look to it. This is definitely uh, some chunky bark. But I did have to check the leaves to be sure. Raisin bran chunk. See, I know the leaves because they got the shiny tilt to, like tint to them and they reflect the sun a lot. And uh, the, actually, the dead giveaway for me was this little ball of cotton that just rolled on by. Oh. And I was like, oh, where's the cottonwood? Yeah, the other thing I love about the leaves is when the wind blows, they like shiver way more than the other leaves. When a normal tree has wind, it just kind of sways, but a cottonwood, each individual leaf like shivers. Thomas also spotted this buckeye tree with reddish leaves, likely due to wet conditions. And in the distance, a blue jay perched on a branch. It's funny because we were hearing like construction sounds earlier, but it still feels like very secluded and nature-y and... But we're not even five miles away from downtown. Yeah. I like it. I like that the Scioto's right there. I like that you got these viney trees over here. <laughs> it's really weird. That is a big sycamore right there. Whoa, that is. This is actually really soft. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you could all hear that, but we just heard a barred owl hooting. It's funny because we're like not even like a quarter mile in, but it already feels like we're encountering like a lot of nature. Like, I feel like sometimes I see more wildlife in the city almost. Like, yes. you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. Yes. This is their one haven. Everything else has kind of been yeah, yeah. pushed aside. We again came to a path that branched towards the river and opened up into a wide expanse. We decided to explore around a bit and take in the scenery. This looks just like a bunch of rivers that I've canoed in various parts of Ohio. I mean, <laughs> the brown is the main feature, but like, <laughs> but even the way the riverbank looks, it kind of reminds me a lot of that. Like summers spent during high school and college. This is the Scioto River. The word Scioto comes from the Wyandotte word for deer. The deer were probably such an important source of food for people. I also heard that the reason this got its name Deer River is that deer are plentiful here in Ohio and every summer they would come and they'd have to shed. And along the sycamore and the, the, the cottonwood they'd, they'd scratch their, their fur mm. and they'd shed and all the fur would go into the river and so they would see just the hair floating, floating down the side. Oh, wow. So it looked like it, it was all deer hair. That's the side of the river. Huh. More myth than fact. There's all sorts of birds everywhere, and I'm noticing some sort of swift or swallow. So I think these are northern ruffed wing swallows. But you can tell how their wings are kind of like bent backwards, uh, like a very aerodynamic. And they keep skimming right along the water looking for insects and stuff to eat. It's really cool to see. We also saw some sort of fish jumping from the water. Now, it was back to the main trail. In the meantime, I was enjoying the beautiful lake scenery, but the weather was becoming questionable. Well, the prophecy has come to pass and it is raining. So I've got out my rain gear for the time being. It's very, very light. Like I'm standing under the trees, I barely even feel it. So hopefully it'll just pass by. It's just a really, really quick drizzle, but I'm hoping I find that campsite soon. 
Definitely gonna set up at the next one I find. Thankfully, the drizzle didn't last too long, and I continued on. I actually passed up a group of campsites that people were actually staying at. So that was about two miles into the trail, which uh, is good because it means that there are campsites somewhere around here, but it's, it was still too early. So I'm gonna go a little further and see if I can find something maybe about three miles in. At the worst, I'll hike back to these. Further up the trail, I found an established but cramped campsite and considered setting up. So right as I had decided to settle for that less than good campsite, ran into a couple people and they told me that they saw more campsite clearings up ahead so I decided I'd take my chances and go check those out instead. There's a little entrance here, could be a campsite, although I do hear voices so it may be taken, but I think I'm going to go check it out. As I explored further, I heard more voices. Yeah, I definitely think someone's over there, so I'm not gonna bother scrambling through that bramble. Back on the trail, there was a chorus of frogs. Sort of sounds like those uh, radiation detectors. As it turns out, they were northern cricket frogs singing happily from the lily pad covered lake. Okay, so I came along a junction which connected the backpacker trail to the lakeshore trail. The backpacker trail was the one that me and Robbie took on our second day here to kind of extend our trip. But I double backed just a little bit and found a pretty decent campsite. And I did say I would take the first campsite I found. And it looks like it will support a hammock. And it's got a decent fire ring. So honestly, I'm glad with this. I'll take it. And I'm exhausted. As Brian settled into camp, I continued winding down the Bloodroot Trail. The trail was much more wooded here. Wow. Okay, this is the first actual forest I've been in. I wonder how long it's gonna last. Actually, I'm gonna take this opportunity to take a break real quick. It's a little muddy, but much less likely for there to be ticks here. Okay, I've been hiking for about three miles. I'm not tired at all, but for some reason, just today, it just feels so relaxing. I don't feel like a particular need to go very fast. But I think it might also be because I don't have to hike that much. So in my brain, my expectations are just take it easy. Oh man, I hope it doesn't rain tonight because I couldn't find my rain jacket, so. painted turtle sunbathed in a nearby stream. And before long, I was back in the sun myself. Yeah, this is a very interesting trail. Just kind of like a mowed path in the middle of a bunch of farmland. I wonder what they're growing. I'm like 90% certain that's corn, but fortunately I don't have Andrew with me. It was indeed corn. And so I continued hiking along acres and acres of cornfield. You know, I'm sure life could get better than this, but no reason to get greedy. No reason to get greedy, indeed. With everything happening in the world, it's amazing how much of an escape the outdoors can be. When you're alone and surrounded by the serenity of nature, or even rural farmland, reality can seem so distant. 
being beneath the sunshine is a good reminder that it really is the small things in life that make us the happiest. I'm trying to figure out what this place reminded me of. It's Glacial Lake State Park. I went to that place with uh, two of our viewers, Alex and Daryl, and it's a similar type of prairie. Well, this is farmland, but it was a prairie with a path carved through it. It feels like I've been hiking for a lot longer, but I'm only at mile three. And to get to the campsites, man, that's past mile seven. I would have to really start booking it. It's 3.54 p.m. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, let's, let's get down to business. Before long, I reached a junction. Backpack campsites to the right. That's a nice looking bench. Then I came up to a sign showing how far the campsites were. Well, on the sign-in sheet, it looked like nobody else had taken campsite three. I could either go 0.6 miles right to it, or I could go quite a few miles around this way to get to it. Considering it gets dark at like eight or 9 p.m., I feel like I still got four hours. I might as well take this. I'll just be sitting in camp otherwise. Yeah, let's go. I can smell a campfire, I think, but I can't see one. The trail took me back into the open. Here, I saw something intriguing in somebody's backyard. Oh, I actually saw that on the way in on the road, but these guys have an RC car track. That's pretty cool. Oh, just under four hours of hiking. Oh, I'll take a break for a little while. Oh, maybe get some food. Oh man, I'm pretty tired. Pretty tired now. Thomas and I continued hiking along the river, past a large fallen cottonwood tree. We came to a junction with a marker pointing towards the first campsite. As the clouds rolled by, we kept hiking. And I spotted some mushrooms that piqued Andrew's interest. Ooh, what are these? Oh, whoa. These are inky cat mushrooms. And it's kind of cool because you can see all the different stages from fresh to inky, and then also the mushrooms that are kind of in between. But as these mushrooms sprout and then get older in age, they kind of melt into this black goop, and that's actually how they spread the spores. But the fresh ones are actually edible, you know, perfectly fine to cook and eat, but if you eat them with alcohol, you could get sick or poisoned uh, because of the way that the alcohol reacts with the chemical in the mushroom. So don't get uh, drunk off of your <laughs> mushroom saute. <laughs> As we continued, the golden evening light shimmered through the leaves, and birds sang out from the treetops. Now, we entered a relatively flat and open section of the forest. This area looks like it could be a campsite, but I don't think it actually is. But it's got like wide open expanse. For a place that's so close to downtown Columbus, this place really, really lives up to its name. It really is a grove down here. Yeah, that's true. It's like so open everywhere here. It's just something you really don't see anywhere in Ohio. Yeah. Everything is usually pretty much thick and dense. It's super pretty here. Like. It really does feel like we're just way away from the city. Yeah. Along the muddy path, we saw more signs of nearby trees. So if you're wondering why Cottonwood got its name Cottonwood, you can probably take a guess why. So when the wind blows, these things just go for acres and acres. And if you live in a neighborhood where these are plentiful, on the side of the road, you'll just see these scattered up. It almost looks like snow. Look how easily this falls apart. Just like with one little breeze. It's pretty 
pretty cool actually. <laughs> I didn't think it would be that easy. Now, the trail took us out of the forest into a quiet, sunny field. I love parts of trails that look like this, mm -hmm. where you just come out and it's suddenly a big open meadow. Especially at this time of day when the sun is just right. Yeah, yeah. Oof. This is the beginning of summer. Yeah. This is the real beginning of summer now. I think it's well deserved after this winter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also that hill there, we've talked about the idea of Yugen before, but it's like the idea of like looking at the top of a hill and not knowing what's beyond it. That's kind of what that hill makes me feel. Want to get to the campsite? Let's do it. This is campsite two? Two. Dang, this is nice. Maybe we should have done two instead of three. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of privacy. Yeah. Well, that's what the ranger told me is like, this is right by the trail and... Yeah, I don't think campsite three is that far. I think if we just keep walking for like five minutes, we'll get to it. I'm okay with that. Yeah. My trail continued through the woods, where I saw a beech tree that had seen its fair share of people. The sun and summer heat had left me feeling ready to settle down for the day. And eventually, I came to an intersection. Okay, I just came from down here. This is like a four-way intersection. The path continues this way, and there's a loop, and it'll come back to this point. I'm not feeling super gun-ho today, so I think I'm gonna skip this loop. I'm just gonna continue on down this way. There's six campsites. Like I said, I'm gonna try to do number three. That's what I put on the signing sheet, but I'll just see which ones are open. Yeah, hopefully there's not some amazing view. I don't think there is. <laughs> okay, let's go. I continued through the woods and spotted some daddy long legs in the leaf litter below, as the birds sang from the treetops. All right, this is campsite number six. Smell a campfire over there. Let's hope for my sake that not all of them are already taken. I don't think they should be, they should be fine. Soon, I found another campsite. Okay, here's site number five. Somebody's already there. As I kept looking for vacant campsites, I came back to another intersection I had passed by earlier. Oh, that's where I had lunch just a second ago. Well, I guess I could have skipped that loop. That's okay, because now I know for sure that campsite five and six are full. So if all the other campsites are full, then I may just be out of luck, but we'll find out. Okay, well campsite four is available. Since I put three on the sign-in sheet, I'll go to three. But if three is full, I got four to come back to. Okay, looks like campsite three is taken. I'm gonna go back to four. Maybe one and two are open, but I know for sure four is, so I'm going back. And if in the meantime, somebody got to four, we're sharing a campsite. <laughs> Luckily, campsite four was still available, and I took a load off and checked for ticks. Then, before doing anything else, I began to set up my shelter for the night. After countless times not setting up our shelter as soon as we get to camp, we finally learned that you need to set up immediately because you don't know when it's gonna rain and you also will only get more tired later on. That being said, I'm not putting the rain fly on because I'm going for the gamble. Wonder if Brian and Andrew are already at their campsites. All right, so since it's a short hike and it's a solo hike, I thought I'd bring a meal that was a little more worth it. But first, I gotta get a fire started. Fortunately, around here, there's lots of nice little twigs. Probably shouldn't have any problem. Okay, I know this is sacrilege to some people that will remain unnamed, but I'm gonna use some wet fire to get this started because I don't have the patience or the energy. Today, I was using the blast match that Andrew got for my birthday last year. All right, let's see how this goes. Oh, there it goes, ready. All right. All right, all right, all right. 
Hopefully this wood is dry enough to burn. Okay, there we go, there we go. Oh, yeah, it's catching. Oh yeah, come on. All right. Okay, I think we're safe. I think we're in the clear now. Okay, we did it. Now obviously not the exact same way that Andrew does it, but I will take it. The trail to the next campsite brought us out into the open. There's a building over there. Yeah, we're at a junction now. There's campsite three. Oh. Talk about living the life of luxury. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's it look? It's our little private oasis. Look at this. All right, so be honest. Which site looks cooler to you? Man, probably the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Did someone else reserve that one? No, actually, they were both open. And I feel like no one's gonna be reserving it by now. I'm okay with that. <laughs> we called the Nature and the Center, said and they let us switch our campsite reservation location, last minute. Right? And on the way back, we found a tasty snack. So these are raspberries. You can tell because when you pull them off, there's no green bit on the inside. If the green part stayed attached, then that would be a blackberry. And it's probably still underripe because I think these are actually supposed to be black raspberries, but I am gonna give it a shot. It's actually not bad. It's like kind of tart, not super sweet, but it's not as like pucker mouth as I thought it would be. Making sure mine is bug free right now. I come back in a couple weeks. <laughs> but for finding something on the side of a trail, that's not bad at all. So we were concerned because this is a meadow that there wouldn't be any place to hang up the uh, tarp. But the beautiful people at the Metro Park. Wow, they really thought of everything. What a tough hike. <laughs> we're not even taking like a big load off right now. No. <laughs> Why can't all backpacking trips be like this? Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> ah. Oh yeah. As the evening set in, it was time for us to prepare a fire. First, I arranged the burnt logs to create a platform for our fire. Next, I split the wood that the park generously provided at each campsite and feathered some of the pieces for tinder and kindling. Admittedly, my knife was a tad dull, but nicely split pieces of hardwood are usually a breeze to feather regardless. As Andrew feathered sticks, I gathered some scraps for extra kindling. Now it was time to start the fire. I definitely could have made more feather sticks, but we were eager to get dinner cooking. Beautiful. Eventually, we had a flame and we added our kindling. Keep going. We'll put the whole thing on. Just the whole thing? Yeah, I think so. We didn't quite have enough tinder to keep the flames going to ignite our kindling, and eventually, it all went out. Why are you incompetent? Because <laughs> Thomas was rushing me. I knew we needed more Tinder. I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Meanwhile, I had an idea for a food crime I could commit, thanks to another item courtesy of Christian. Now, whether it's good or not, that remains to be seen. Well, I'm sure it's going to taste good. But good in the kind of more absolute sense. Hot and spicy spam. <laughs> Apparently, this is one of his favorite things to bring camping. I'm going to put it in my cheese quesadilla. I'm not exactly well prepared for this, but I figure, you know, I just open it up, take a few pieces out, heat them up. I mean, that does not look appetizing. <laughs> I mean, look at that, dude. That looks terrible. I have had Spam before, though, so I'm pretty sure it'll be just fine, but ugh. Why would anybody make this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
Oh, it, it is spicy though. Get some of that cheese in there. This could be a really bad idea. We'll see. No, this is a great idea. This is the best idea. Not one of the best ideas. This is the best idea. In just a moment, I would discover that nobody should ask me for ideas. Put the whole lot of you right on there. Maybe it doesn't look the most appetizing. Uh, in fact, let's say that looks the least appetizing, but I bet it'll taste decent. Okay, let's give it a taste. Not bad. Took a second for the flavor Stockholm syndrome to kick in, but once it did, I was sitting pretty. Meha. Meha. So to elaborate a little more on what I'm cooking, it's not like super fancy, but I did bring some frozen flank steak, which I let thaw over the course of the day, and some green peppers, which I pre-cut, and then some seasoning. Hopefully this turns out well. With a nice bed of embers, I started cooking my steak on an old pan that I didn't mind getting scorched. The meat sizzled nicely, but parts of it were still frozen together. Cooking this is definitely going to be a challenge. I added sliced green bell peppers to the pan, then seasoned the steak with a mix including salt and pepper. The steak was browning, so I simmered it with some water. Now it was time to give this campfire steak a taste test. Right, let's try the green peppers first. Mmm, still got some crunch to them. Good taste. Of course, for the main dish. Just gently cut this here. Mmm, it's got a good taste to it. A little chewy, but it tastes good. And obviously, the standards are a bit lower right now. Mmm. I would call that a success. You know, I wonder what the other guys are eating tonight. I can tell you it's not steak. Or maybe it was. So I forgot I actually did bring foolproof tinder, which is birch bark, which would have actually made that totally successful if I had just put that on, but. You wanted to see if you could do it the all natural way. Sure, yeah. So now I'm scraping this bark so that it turns into a dust that we can actually spark. Because even though the bark is really flammable, um, you still want something that can catch a spark in the first place. Look at that dust right there. Yeah. What if I sneeze? That would suck. <laughs> also because of the pandemic, I'd rather you not. <laughs> <laughs> That was so fast this time. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Dude, not even fair. Yeah, birch bark is incredible. Is it the oils in it? Yeah, the oils just light up even if it's wet. How about those twigs? Those twigs aren't catching, are they? The twigs might be damper than we thought. I, don't I know. thought they were pretty brittle. I just snapped them in half. Yeah, I'm not sure. There they go. Well, they're, yeah, they're going. They're, they're going. going. They're just taking their, their sweet time. Now that the fire was going steadily, it was time to prepare our own steak dinner. So today we're making shish kebabs. They're kind of deconstructed, so we gotta put the meat on separately here. And I think we can afford to put two on one, don't you think? I think we can put three on one. <laughs> three on one? Blasphemy. Dang, you can hear that sizzle. Along with the steak, we were cooking some vegetables and grilling extra bits from our steak. This is the gristle here, just the fat. We're just gonna let that cook there. Mm. Delicious. The meat was cooked perfectly over the fire. Now, time to indulge. Dink. Dink it and sink it. 
Holy crap. Mm. That is like the most tender piece of beef I've ever had in my life. This is so good. Oh my god. That is a medium steak. That is good. That is so good. Ah. Oh. Even got a little bit of crispiness on the outside. Yeah, it's, it's got like, it's definitely been seared by that fire. And it's got so much flavor. Oh mm. my god. Well done, Tom. There's, there's two more. <laughs> Let's go grab one. Another skewer here. I think my favorite thing about this is how crunchy the outside is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Fire. But yeah, these are like crispy, but so tender on the inside. I'm glad we're not in bear country. No. <laughs> when I eat this, it makes me realize that's really all you need to be happy. <laughs> like meat? what else? Yeah, just meat <laughs> on a fire. What else do I need in life right now? <laughs> mm. More steak was cooking on the fire. And we also had our roasted vegetables and gristle to attend to. Our second course had all cooked to perfection in the embers. I have to be careful not to get the ash on all the food here. It's a rookie mistake. We're not rookies no more. <laughs> Oh wow. That means Those onions are perfect. Everything should be done. Good lord. Oh, look at that gristle, Andrew. Oh. That's all yours. Alright. All right. Bon Cheers. appetit. <laughs> it smells amazing. It smells kind of nostalgic to me. Mmm. Mmm. Zucchini squash is so good. Those mushrooms? Mmm. Oh my god. Mmm. Mm hmm. Just like bursting with flavor. It is. Oh my god. If you don't like mushrooms, come talk to us. That's we'll right. tell you what to do about <laughs> that. Mmm. Mm. I'm gonna try this gristle piece. Oh man. Are you sure you don't want to try a bite this end? No, that's all yours. Wow, that is so good. This is like beef bacon. Ah. Uh, that zucchini is hot. Mm hmm. Dude, these are cooked perfectly. Yeah. We got so lucky. It's so good. Or we're both very smooth chefs. Maybe after <laughs> five years of doing this. <laughs> By the way, oh yeah, happy fifth year anniversary. Yeah, to also, Adventure Archives. Also, happy birthday soon. Happy birthday to you. So Andrew and I practically share a birthday. Mm -hmm. We're one day apart in two years. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances? One out of three hundred sixty-four. Three. One hundred sixty-three. Three hundred sixty-three. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. This is why I'm not allowed to talk. <laughs> I don't think the other guys could possibly be having as good of a time as we are. Yeah, I feel bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. I did a solo trip uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that was like, it was really fun and it was energetic. And I felt like I, you know, it felt great. But this time, knowing that my usual hiking companions are out there hiking somewhere else, instead of making me feel less lonely, like, oh yeah, somebody's doing this with me. Actually, ironically, it makes me feel more lonely because I'm like, man, they're not here. Can't make dumb jokes. I had to start my own crappy fire. <laughs> Brian usually brings the toilet paper. I forgot toilet paper. Anybody who thinks that they're truly independent and that they don't need other people, it's like, man, unless you're hunting and foraging for food and making your own shelter, you rely on other people all the time. You just don't know it because you don't actually see any of them. Even me, I don't consider myself the most social person, but when you don't have any social interaction with your best friends for a while, I'm like, okay, that's, I'm getting tired of that. The moments I remember most fondly in life are when I'm like around a fire with friends with food and drinks. Like that's all I need in life. You got fire, you got food and drinks, but I don't love friends. <laughs> <laughs> I could not think of a better way to say goodbye to you, to Ohio, to everyone here, than to sit around a campfire on probably the nicest day of the entire year. Yeah, yeah. Got right it. here. The only thing I regret is that we didn't do more of this more often. <laughs> I know. I don't know, when you're trapped in society, you forget how easy it is to just like do something like this and how much enjoyment you can get from it. Trapped in society. I've been trapped in my room for the last... Yeah, yeah. You know, we've all been trapped in our room for the last several months. You don't want to have those moments like we're having right now, where it's like, I wish I did this more often. Yeah. When those, yeah. When those opportunities are gone. You want to seize that. I'm telling you, man, like, that's all it is, is you just need, like, warmth, food, drinks, family and friends. You don't need, like, a marble statue. You just need marble beef. <laughs> marble beef? I like that. Uh, after dinner, 
pretty much nothing else to do, just go straight to bed. I'm gonna sleep really well tonight, and I think my plan is to get up kinda early tomorrow, get a good start on the hike. All right, good night. So I ended up sleeping almost 12 hours. It's like 11 a.m., but I slept really well last night. I'm really comfortable. I don't really have anything uh, to do this morning. Didn't plan for breakfast. So I think what I'm going to do is just pack up and head out. After packing up my gear, I headed out of camp and was back on the trail for my hike out. I haven't really started to see areas that I recognize when I was here with Robbie and I. At one point we came to a road and we kind of just like cut across back onto the Lakeshore Trail. But actually now that I'm talking, this river part that I'm walking next to kind of looks familiar because I kind of remember walking next to a river and, and you know we kind of pointed it out because it looked really nice. Maybe this is part of the trail that we hiked on now. The Calm River was complemented by the awe-inspiring sandstone bluffs along the trail. I came to an intersection where things started to look more familiar. Well, now that I'm on the other side of the lake, it's starting to look a lot like the area where Robbie and I waited for Andrew before we met up. The cliffside or the ridge face or whatever you want to call it over there kind of starting to remind me of where we camped the second night. So I'm going to keep looking. Maybe I can find the spot where we actually waited. So as you can see, I'm at the Lakeshore Vesuvius Backpack Trail Junction. I'm almost certain this is where Robbie and I waited to meet for Andrew. So I'm going to keep going and uh, see if I can spot where we camped too. Along the trail, I found some ghost pipe flowers, a parasitic, almost translucent plant. And then I saw our former campsite and sitting rock. Well, I found it, so I think I'm gonna have some lunch. Dude, it struck me when I woke up this morning, it is so peaceful right now. It never ceases to amaze me that no matter what is going on in the human world, if you come out just into the natural world where we're not really there, it is completely different. They have almost nothing to do with each other. Regardless of human affairs, wherever there is nature, the universe carries on as always. And nothing is better than when you can share that peace with other people. This might be pretty obvious to most people, but the experience hiking when you're with a group, it's so much less about where you go and how many miles you do and what the scenery is like. And it's just the people you're with. It just doesn't really matter. We could do a mile a day. It's still good times. It's very different feelings. Each have their own distinct appeal. But right now, I'm missing that group flavor. An unusually cool night had woken Andrew and I early in the morning. Using the still warm embers and leftover birch bark, we got a much needed fire going. Okay. We sat in the campfire's warmth for hours, talking about our past travels and our hopes for a better future. Eventually, we were off. The trail again took us into the open, where there was an overlooked deck and other structures standing nearby. We think this is the old campsite that we were originally going to go to, but they've changed it on us since then. This is a pretty cool place, but you don't really get much of a view or access to the river. Yeah, and you're right next to that building. Yeah. So. It doesn't really feel like you're roughing it with a parking lot right behind you. There. Yeah. You can see why they changed it. Down the trail, we found some interesting plants. So this is called autumn olive. Uh, it's an invasive plant from Japan, but it's got leaves with like little pores on it. And on the other side, there's sort of this silvery color on it. Um, but this has some berries in the fall that you can eat. And they're best when they're already like kind of shriveled up because if you eat a plump one, it kind of like dries your mouth out. Uh, but when they're shriveled, it's kind of good. It's kind of like a little, you know, craisin or something, nice and sweet. 
So down here there's also something called moon seed, uh, which is kind of a poisonous look-alike of grape. You can tell it's different because it doesn't have serrations and the margins are really smooth, but it's a vining plant that grows berries with a little crescent moon-shaped seed on the inside. Uh, and unlike the grapes, they are poisonous. So we're just walking. We have no idea what this is. It looks like a bridge or something. You know, I think I remember seeing on the map something about a rope bridge, actually. This almost looks like a rope course. Yeah. This thing is huge. We made our way onto the rope bridge, which had been very wobbly and disorienting. Uh, whoa. <laughs> That was cool. That's really cool. That was cool. Yeah. My legs are wobbly. Like you were saying, this is the most unnecessary rope bridge, but it was fun. <laughs> you can also take the rock path over there, but that's no fun. Coming out to another meadow. This feels a bit like high banks, you know? Yeah, exactly what you're talking about. This begins the loop. All right, so we want to go left. Doesn't matter. The trail now took us onto a loop through a meadow, and see? there were many interesting plants in this new yeah, environment. All right, so this is a mulberry tree. These actually grow all around the city too. We're a little early in the season, so most of the mulberries are underripe. And I've heard that the underripe ones have like some mild toxins. I think this is a white mulberry, which is the invasive kind, but I know that because the leaves are smooth, but either way, berries are edible. I feel like they kind of have a sweet figgy taste, but I've got one here that's like as ripe as we can find, and I'm gonna try it. It's because it's already turning a little black, which is what you want. Mm. Not bad, much more tart than most of them are, but uh, actually I think I see another if you want to try one. Oh boy, here I go trying fruit again. Wow. It was like the smallest explosion ever, but it was just barely tart and very sweet. But as far as foraging goes, Brian's find took the cake. Okay, this is a great find actually. This is chicken of the woods and it's really fresh. You can tell because of just how clean it is. Oh, it even feels still like chicken, like squishy. Um, but you can see there's like no blemishes and it's still got a vibrant orangish, almost pinkish color. If Andrew was here, we would definitely be eating this, but he's not. So I think I'll leave this here just to go through the normal process. Andrew would definitely have loved to see this. For now, I continued hiking amid the light summer drizzle. One thing that's very noticeable from when I came here with Robbie and Andrew is the effect the season has on this place. It's the early summer right now. Everything is fully grown and you really can't see the lake at all from the Lakeshore Trail. Whereas in our last trip, you could just see the lake regardless of where you were on the trail. In addition to that, a lot of the spots that we hiked along, I don't recognize anymore. The only ones that I really recognize are the ones that have very noticeable landmarks, like the big rock at the campsite we stayed at, uh, and probably a few others that I'll probably run into on my hike out. Something about the expansive lake and the downpour really accentuated the solo part of this hike. I've had a lot of time on this trip to kind of reflect on solo hiking. It's not bad, but I can definitely say with certainty that it's not for me. And I know a lot of people solo hike and they enjoy the, the solitude that you get out here. But for me, even if it was just one other person, I think this is an experience that's just better shared with someone. I guess that kind of goes with our philosophy since we're filming it. We may come out here by ourselves sometimes, but we still film it because we still think it's something that's worth being shared with other people. Ultimately, that's what being outdoor teaches you. The best and simplest pleasures are even better shared with all. As I hiked, I had a view of Salamone Lake, and the trail soon led me to another campsite. Looks like only campsite one was empty besides the one I went to. Wow, this would have been a nice campsite too. Got a nice lakeside view, pretty cool homemade bench and plenty of firewood. Well, that's a nice looking lake. What a beautiful, beautiful morning. Now, it was time to find my way out. And though the trip had been somewhat lonely, the morning sun kept my spirits high.
strange to encounter beauty when you're alone. Nature can be overwhelmingly joyful, but without anyone to share it with, there's also a slight pain of sadness. A feeling of wanting to bottle up these feelings is simple pleasure, to hold on to them forever. We've said it over and over, but our time outdoors has taught us that it's simple pleasures that are the most fulfilling in life. We've never felt happier than when we've experienced the warmth of a fire, full bellies after a good meal, the touch of the wilderness, and of course, the company and camaraderie of our closest friends and family. With social strife and global pandemics, sometimes it takes getting back to nature to remember that there is still something to hope for, that there is still joy in the world. Sometimes all it takes to remember is a simple hike at the park, the smell of a wildflower, or the taste of a forged plant. So down here is a type of wild garlic and you can actually see the bulbs growing on the top of the plant and from some of those bulbs there's like little leaf looking things coming out of it but you could take each of those little bulbs and break it up and eat it and it tastes kind of like garlicky. But you find all sorts of like onion and garlic species growing in the wild all the time. But reconnecting with nature isn't just about escaping the problems of life. It's about learning what it means to be human, to live happily, and to bring that back to our everyday life. Think about the absolute peace and serenity you feel in nature. We believe that everyone is entitled to that kind of peace. And when people can't even have that, sometimes they cry out in pain or anguish. It goes without saying that this has been a rough year for all of us. Many of us have lost loved ones, dealt with hardship, and more. When the going gets tough, the least we can do is to try and build a world where everyone can have peace. Escaping to the serenity of the woods is nice, but nobler is to return to society and do what we can to bring that peace to others in this world. Because we can make it through difficult times, but only when we act on our desire to share our joy with everyone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I know what Robbie's gonna be eating on stream. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm like actually legitimately embarrassed at my uncreativity. <laughs> I went to a local place nearby called Armadillo Burgers, and you're gonna see one of the most beautiful burgers. <laughs> I thought there I thought there was gonna be more after that. <laughs> Me too. No, no. no We're that's all like, that's the most beautiful burger. What? Okay, well whose is worse? I, mine's probably the worst, right? So we, I've just got pasta and veggies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian, <laughs> worst. <laughs> I got this like Chinese food. Ooh. There's like, Ooh. like shrimp, shrimp and eggs, eggplant, and like a fried chicken wing, except it's not fried. Red cooked eggplant. Oh, just a chiedzi. Hong sao chiedzi. Can you show it one more time and give a rundown of each individual item one more time? <laughs> <laughs> that looks like very authentic Chinese, Andrew. Oh shoot, what's Chinese for cheers? Ganbei. Ganbei. Brian. You and I were saying it would be either tacos or barbecue, right? In your defense, Andrew, it was going to be tacos, but the taco <laughs> place next to me closed at three o'clock today. So instead I got a burger from a place called Armadillo Burgers. Uh, like it came with a toothpick. Sounds... That's how wow. you know it's going to be big. Oh yeah. Oh, man. Is it as big as an armadillo? <laughs> that looks nice. Oh, that looks Ooh, good. yeah. Looks kind of like a McRib actually. Look at that. All right, I'm a dinky to the... Yeah. To the... Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Sorry, we left you off, mm. Thomas, but what else? That's all right. That's all right. I got to put the condiments on here, so give me a second. That's a lot of condiments. This chicken is good. Mm. Ellie just came out of nowhere. That eggplant is good. This pizza's a little undercooked. I the shrimp know. and eggs is really good. Woo! Oh, man, that's a big burger, Thomas. Your chewing is so loud for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> watching Thomas right now is like watching a lion on a gazelle. <laughs> the shrimp and eggs is really good, actually. Because, like, I, I always cook eggs at home with, like, random stuff mixed in, but uh, the flavor is, like, super good. It's not the trash I make at, like, 2 a.m. <laughs> Don't worry, Andrew. Nothing's like the trash you make at 2 a.m. <laughs> the way Andrew eats at night is the same way I eat when I'm camping by myself. It's like that scene when Homer's making breakfast when Marge is gone. Oh, Slow, I got a visitor here. <laughs> oh, we got two you know, animals at the see? post hike meal. This is the first. So, uh, how was everybody's camping trip that we just got back from? <laughs> Mine was sad and lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was actually a lot of fun. The night before I was going to bed, I was like, yeah, I'm going to bed at like 1030 and I'm going to, you know, get a good night's sleep, wake up early, start hiking early. And then I woke up and I was so comfortable and I was like, if I'm going to be out here for just one night, <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy this one night. <laughs> so I, I slept until like 11. I think me and Thomas were like out by 11. Yeah, I was gonna we say, got up really I'm early. Home by 12. Thomas, are you done eating already? Yep. Man, Thomas, Thomas you your reputation know. still holds up, man. Yeah. I do have two post meal surprises. Let me see if I can grab them. Wait, if you're getting dessert, I'm gonna get dessert real quick. I ain't got no dessert. <gasps> and here's where I would eat my ice cream if I had some. <laughs> well, Dude, social distancing sucks. I don't know if you guys remember when we were in Texas, the Deep South episode, we stopped by and look at this because everything is bigger in Texas. This is a full mm. half gallon. I've got sure. this Jenny's ice cream. It's like some sort of pecan explosion. <laughs> I like how your video it's is so just good. solid frozen. I'll close can... my eyes and imagine the ice cream. <laughs> BRB, and while this... imagining because no picks in the Whoa, hamster. that's a lot of ice cream, dude. <laughs> good Lord, man. That's like more than my dinner. <laughs> oh, Brian and Andrew swap spots. Oh, there's the ice cream. Let me show you all the consequence of living with someone who works at an ice cream store. Like, Holy I went up and Holy cow. <laughs> oh my God. all of the ice cream in our freezer right now. Well. <laughs> well, that was quite a post like meal. Thank you everybody for joining, etc. What a waste of everybody's time. In <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you guys. See ya. All, all right, right everybody. You. Bye. Thank, Thank you for joining everybody. Me. S1 went in. Why are we still here? Just to suffer? Every night I can feel my tripod legs and my lenses, even the batteries, the camera bodies I've lost, the drone I've lost. They won't stop hurting. I'm the one who got caught up on that log, an obstacle above paddling, even Brian. And I was submerged below Struggling to get my bearings. They came after Jasper Caparata too. Then Tom Moore. The river keeps growing, swallowing everything in its path. Getting bigger and bigger. Who knows how big now? Salvador Gonzalez. I just need him to do one thing. I want him to tell Natalia, you're looking forward to going on as many adventures with her as possible. And you won't rest until you do. How long until the episode comes out and we can finally watch it on YouTube? 17 days. 17 days? 17 days? I hate to rain on your parade, but we're not even gonna last 17 hours. Les Bird. I mean, they're out there. Les Bird. This girl, Megan, survived longer than that, and she didn't have Netflix or TikTok. Why don't you put her in charge? First Officer John Truitt's log of the Starship Expedition Research, LLC. Captain Dan Vulcan remains unconscious. Dr. Lisa Truitt has examined him and has determined he's living out an entire lifetime in his dreams. Seize the time. Live now. Make now always the most precious time. Now will never come again. Come on, we got the plans for Mary Sin Cabbage. She wants to give a special shout out to her camping bunnies, Ginny and Tammy. Help! Aaron Jones, let us in. 
I want to give a special shout out to Aaron Jones' parents for a happy anniversary. But you gotta let us in. We got the plants right here. Oh God. Charlie's out. Charlie's out. Come on. Charlie's out. Take the plans. Take the plans. Take the plans. Your Highness, it's the transmission we received. What is it they sent us? Hope. It's an honor to finally meet you, Anne McBride. Jason Bourgeois, at your service. I'm looking for a murderer. He boarded this ship. I'm impressed. But it is my boat, and if you'd like a tour, I'd love to give it to you myself. Lin Chen and Jim Potts, deadliest of enemies but slaves under my command. Enough! This will have to wait for the tournament at Mortal Kombat. Man, I thought, I thought I was doing okay. I was like, you know, Ohio doesn't have many scary things out here. The worst <laughs> thing that could happen is maybe a turkey wanders its way in the camp. Completely forgot about coyotes. Yeah. There's a whole pack of coyotes. I'll kick a coyote. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs>